Okay, so let's get started. Based on some concepts of universal design for learning, I put together a three-part series discussing how using simulated factory environment can enhance teaching machine controls programming. For part one, I am using a simulated factory environment to demonstrate realistic machine control systems. Part two explores the same factory environment to venture into project management. And part three utilizes another simulated factory as a cooperative classroom project with manageable complexity. For the purpose of this session, let's concentrate on part one, using a simulated factory environment to teach real machine controls. What I am trying to do is look at the universal design for learning concepts created by the Center for Applied Special Technology, or CAST, and focus on providing options for comprehension, such as activate or supply background knowledge, highlight patterns, critical features, big ideas and relationships, guide information processing and visualization, and maximize the transfer and generalization. So part one. There's, there are several items I will be covering here, including a detailed overview of the software I've used to create the simulated factory. Now, the reason for the detail is because I feel that this type of tool is very underutilized and can be much more and much more can be accomplished by digging a little bit deeper. So let's take a look at the traditional approach to PLC learning. Shown here are two common trainers, one from IndiaMart.com and the other one listed on TechLabs.com. Both seem to be perfectly good training systems. Now, having hardware is always a good place to begin, and it is an absolute necessary step in the learning process, especially for those who have not yet been exposed to, the, to this type of hardware. A hardware simulator provides a demonstration of physical connections, also the interconnections between modules and components, hardware file updates, i.e. firmware, experience in configuration and settings, and exposure to real inputs and outputs. And this will always be required. What is missing is the ability to relate to a real, machi real machine or factory, a goal or task-based lesson to keep the student interested beyond basic push buttons and lights, an in-depth demonstration of automatic and manual functionality, and HMI function as it relates to machine control systems. Now, we all know that simulation has been around for decades. Virtual and physical simulations have been used in medical fields, mathematics, architecture, aeronautics, space, and much more. Uh, but why do we do this? Why do we simulate? Well, it's because there is a need for the ability to simulate, to test theories and designs in a safe and cost-effective way without risking equipment damage or, more importantly, human life. With that being said, there is definitely the need for specific criteria or the simulation is not valid. Simulations must have the ability to link the actions and reactions of the model to the real to real world results. Uh, as an example, we want a medical mannequin reacting in the same way as a real person. Uh, CPR, AR, defibrillation, and even childbirthing are critical to medical and first aid training. Mannequin or device must have the ability to react in the same way as a real person so the medical technician can learn exactly how to perform uh, tasks under stress. The aircraft simulators must encompass all the complex inputs and reactions of a real airframe in flight. Uh, what is also very critical, or a very critical component of the simulation, is the ability to collect information. The analysis of the provided data can be utilized not only to improve the model, but also the software, device, or person being subjected to the test. So let's take a look at our requirements. To model real world aspects of equipment, including physical behaviors, such as acceleration and velocity of components, reaction to simulated objects, uh, relate real controller inputs and outputs to the environment, uh, and the objects in the simulation have to have the ability to be manually manipulated, exhibit the same randomness as real world objects, have some mass and react accordingly, and of course observe the same physical rules. Okay, so let's look at a factory or machine simulation. Now, there's quite a few simulators available, but I've been focusing on a piece of software called Factory I.O. I feel that it meets many of the requirements that I listed previously, is user configurable and flexible. It has the ability to start with one level of difficulty, but then can be enhanced to be more challenging and complex by adding objects and equipments. And it has the ability to create and work with assemblies. 
As you can see, the simulation does meet with these requirements that the model should have real world aspects of equipment, including physical behaviors, uh, acceleration, velocity of components. It actually has sound and, and pretty decent 3D representation. Reactions and inter interactions of the objects within the simulation are fairly realistic as well. Uh, in this video, green and blue raw material is converted in the CNC into lids and bases that can be fitted as an assembly. The objects can slide on the conveyor as they interact with rollers at the interface of the two conveyors or the alignment rails on the straight section. At the start of the system, the material is actually sorted with information provided by a camera. Uh, one other aspect is the ability to control the delivery of the parts. After the CNC equipment creates the lids and bases, they are sorted, assembled, and then dropped into an appropriate bin. Nice thing here is that it's relatively simple, but also has enough complexity to look like a real factory. So as I mentioned, it meets many of the criteria that I previously listed. And again, we can also start with one level of complexity and then enhance the factory to be more challenging and complex by adding components and equipment, such as more conveyors or boxes or, or other types of assemblies. Okay, so here is another video showing a warehousing operation. Now all the material has a simulated weight as does the pallet and boxes. Uh, they react to other objects that can also be manipulated. If, for instance, I was to load too many boxes on top of one of these pallets, the pallets would possibly slip or even turn or get caught up on the conveyor. If the boxes are piled too high, they will be knocked over by the movement or when loading into the storage position. Uh, also in the simulation, we have fully interactive push buttons and switches, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Uh, these can be used for controlling operation or for indication. Uh, there's also enunciating with sirens, uh, rotary lights, and, and like I mentioned, panel indicators. This particular package has a wide variety of, of parts. There's more than 80 parts, including machine material handling conveyors, manipulators, various size boxes and pallets, as well as machinable material. There's general build items such as walkways and decks, that sort of thing. Of course, there's also a good selection of sensors, indicators, operators, and warning devices, and I will show, show you all of these over the next few slides. So shown here are some of the manipulatable objects that can be put inside the simulation. Boxes not only come in various sizes, but also have unique weights assigned to them. As you saw in the previous video, uh, pallets and storage boxes are also available. Uh, three objects are used to simulate machining. There's raw material, bases and lids in different colors and materials. These are used in the CNC robot simulation and are unique in that they can actually be assembled together to make a single object. If you're not using the CNC machine, any of those parts can actually be created and exported by the emitter. There's also an assortment of standard sensors available that can be placed anywhere in, in and in any orientation. Each sensor has a discrete output of either true or false to indicate that an object has been detected. The detection is not limited to the previously shown boxes or pallets and machinable parts, but also the moving parts of any of the apparatuses in the simulation, such as a pusher, a door, a diverter, or even the elevator lift itself. And of course, the demo I will show you later uses some of these as an example. Uh, the capacitive and inductive sensors, it should be pointed out, have an additional feature of being able to output a value via an input word to the PLC to indicate how close an object is to the sensor. Also shown here is an light array made up of a sensor receiver pair with multiple outputs that can be used for object height detection, uh, a retroreflective and diffuse optical sensor uh, is also included. A recent addition of an RFID reader and vision sensor is pretty exciting uh, and I'll get into this more in a few slides. In a group called operators, we have an emergency maintained push button. Press it once to set it, press it once again to reset. There's also a standard assortment of blue, green, yellow, and red indicator lights and green, yellow, and red backlit push buttons. There's also a red push button, which is normally closed, and a two-position selector switch and a potentiometer. Of course, there's a box included in order to mount the operators and indicators. Under warning device category, we have our indicators again, but with the addition of a warning siren, a three stack pole light, and a 
rotary warning yellow warning light. There is a variety of non-active components, such as handrails, deck plating and pillars to build the platforms, stairs, uh, and, fe and fencing sections. There's also a fencing section that allows a big conveyor to pass through it, so you could fence in an entire machine. Let's take a look at one of the recent additions to the simulation. There is an actual RFID sensor in the form of a read-write head and RFID tags that are placed on the boxes, pallets, and containers. The RFID head can be used to read or write data to any of these RFID tags. Most of the items include an active tag with the exception of raw materials, products, lids, and bases, which, by the way, can be read by the camera. RFID tags are detected in a range of 0.5 meters when in front of the head, and only one tag can be detected at one time. If there's more than one tag in the field, then either or both of the tags will be ignored which is very much like real-world RFID reading. What is really unique here is that the RFID tag on the object contains 128 words of free memory and a unique serial number. The unique serial number is a sequential number generated as the tag is created by the emitter. The 128 words of memory are user-writable user and stay with the RFID tag throughout the simulation. Also, a recent addition is the encoder feature. Uh, this encoder can be enabled in any of the motors. The output is simply an on-off transition for each of the two traditional incremental encoder phases. This creates an opportunity to discuss the original coder design as opposed to current applied serial parallel Ethernet or other types of communication technology. The vision system consists of a vision camera and a barcode placed on the blue, green, and metal materials. When one of these objects is in the camera sensing area, the camera will output a digital or numeric value that represents the object. If you're just starting out, you have a wide variety of scenes to choose from. The pre-built models include everything from just simply moving a box along a conveyor to sorting materials to filling a tank with fluids. There's also an automated warehouse, a pick and place operation, a CNC production cell, including load and unload robotics. Some of the scenes, such as a CNC cell, have reduced complexity by needing only a run signal to begin operation. Now, these built-in scenes are extremely useful for basic training, but how do we convey the look and feel of a real automation system? So there's definitely a need to develop a simulation that can demonstrate the concepts needed for industry. The problem here is a simulation with even a moderate amount of complexity can take many hours to develop, uh, and this usually is a skill beyond the ability of most classroom environments. Here I've built up a basic full factory simulation. This box factory consists of a box weight scale, a sorting conveyor, transport conveyors, and a stacking and palletizing machine. This is actually just a combination of several scenes within factory I.O. The box weight sorting conveyor, which provides left and right sorting capability, and of course the stacking and palletizing machine itself. I did add extra items to these scenes, such as a few proximity switches for position detection, panels with push buttons, and lights for manual control and status indication. Local manual control is possible via three manual control buttons that are placed around the scene. Of course, as stated previously, the simulated environment should be attached to an actual HMI and PLC. This allows the student to be able to view the real PLC and not just a simulated one. So here's one example of a portable trainer that can be built with a briefcase style box, making it perfect for transport or in classrooms with limited lab space. This includes a Siemens S7 1200 programmable logic controller. This allows me to add fully automatic and manual operations, conditions for fault messaging and basic program block usage, as well as symbols and descriptions of each of the network of rungs in the PLC code itself. As you can see, I've added a Siemens ComfortSoft TP700 HMI. This allows me to show the status of all the I.O. in the system, has manual and automatic mode reset and selection screens, box weight and decisions for the sorting system, and box count and counter reset. As far as Ethernet connectivity is concerned, I've added a hub for the connection point for all the devices, 
And of course, you can make this wireless for some basic IIoT demonstrations. And uh, you'll see a little bit of this uh, later on in the presentation. So here we get to the teaching dilemma. Everybody in the industry knows the fun part is all about programming and coding. Those of us that love to program just want to get our hands on the keyboard as soon as possible. Although programmers are great at creating code, they're not always great at seeing the big picture, and project managers are not always in tune with the needs of the programmer. And this will be covered a little bit more in part two. So in a typical teaching environment, we give the students programming to create, but do very little at detailing where he or she fits into a project in reality. So here's a Gantt chart for a generic project, sharing durations, timelines, milestones, interconnections, all nicely laid out. But consider where you are at the beginning of the project as the programmer. But where we want to be is actually somewhere more in the middle. Okay, this is where the programming life cycle and the coding occurs. This is a very small part of the project. However, this is the part that we enjoy as coders and programmers. This is your piece right here. This is where you want to be. But please notice that your time to code and deliver can be severely compromised, usually due to delays in delivery, constructions, or other events. Not saying this is how, how it will always work, but it's up to you to convince your manager of the importance of being involved at the planning and design activities as a programmer. Now I'll cover this a little bit more in part two of this series. Consider the saying, garbage in, garbage out. If you're not spending a large amount of your program time in planning, designing, and flowcharting your code, you're destined to be one of those who this will refer to. In this familiar paradigm, we have garbage data inputted to a perfect model, we still get garbage results. If we have perfect data, but a garbage model, we still get garbage results. Garbage in, garbage out can be used to refer to any decision-making system where failure to make the right decisions with precise and accurate data can lead to wrong or nonsensual results. What I've attempted to do here is jump to the end of the project instead of focusing on a flawed beginning. I provided a fully completed sorting and assembly line with all the inputs and outputs defined and configured. I've also added operational parameters laid out in the PLC program and HMI. What I created in a way more closely represents what a programming environment might look like or what programmers might be exposed to. Students rarely, if ever, get to see the final product that would help give purpose to their education, the light at the tunnel, so to speak. Now, this is all in line with universal design for learning concepts briefly noted at the beginning of this presentation. Here is an overhead view of the weight scale scene. The green tags indicate standard inputs, whether it's a proximity switch, an optical retro reflector, or diffuse sensor. The outputs are shown in orange, including the motors for the conveyors, direction of the sorting ball table, and the stack pole light. The blue is the word containing the weight output of the scale. I've highlighted extra inputs and outputs with a dashed yellow line. These were added in addition to the standard I.O. already embedded in the scene. The elevator portion attached to the transport conveyor can raise pallets and allow boxes to be stacked on those pallets. The inputs consists of elevator moving status from the simulation to the PLC, pallet entry, loaded, and exit proximity switches. There is one extra switch for pallet load, but does not need to be used in this case. I added two proximity switches, one for elevator raised and another for elevator lowered. Again, I highlighted these with a yellow dash border. As far as the outputs are concerned, there is a motor to raise and lower the elevator as, one, as well as one to move the pallets into the conveyor via a chain drive system. If we look at the top view of the elevator, we see that it is essentially the box organizer. Along with the standard supplied inputs, I also added pusher advanced and pusher returned. There is one input for clamped and another for plate at the advanced or returned limit, and that seems sufficient for what I needed. There's one retro reflective sensor to detect objects just before they enter the elevator pushing area, which again is sufficient for what I need. These are single solenoid type outputs which are used to advance the clamp and return the plates, advance the turn arm, and to advance the pusher. When they are off, all the cylinders can be considered to be home or in the return position. Outputs also control the pallet feed and exit conveyors, the box feed, and load belts. 
The warning light automatically turns on when the elevator is in motion. To add a little bit more realism to the simulation, I added some push button panels. Since these buttons are backlit, there are inputs and outputs associated with the buttons on the panel. Each of these buttons can be manipulated by the operator when the simulation is running by use of the mouse. Included are status displays for weight, box count, palletized layer setting, and the current layer count. Layer configuration can be changed by the HMI or on the panel using the push buttons to add or subtract layers. Near the elevator located on the deck is an auxiliary manual control panel. The elevator control station uses the same backlit push buttons that double as indicator lights. There's also an indicator for manual mode selection and a fault light to give basic status. As with the main panel, there are push buttons to start and stop the conveyors and control the motions and signify the status of each of those motions and of course the status of the motors for the conveyors themselves. When showing the simulation a little later, you can better get a better idea of how all these work. And finally, the pallet entry and exit area has its own push button panel located at the bottom corner of the elevator where it is better to see the pallet conveyors. Manual panels within line of sight of the equipment to be controlled is a very important concept. Similarly, the pallet panel has manual indicators plus the appropriate buttons to start and stop the conveyors. Again, these are also indicators to show the status of the conveyor motors. Now, as I mentioned previously, the simulation uses a real PLC and real HMI. The only difference here between the simulation and a real environment is that, I, is that the actual physical I.O. or inputs and outputs on the system are not on the PLC itself. The inputs and outputs exist within the environment of the simulation. However, there are two items that should be mentioned. If the, if the simulation and programming via if the simulation and programming via TIA portal exist on the same PC, dual network interface cards are needed, one for the simulation and one for TIA portal. The second item is that the I.O. does not update during the traditional I.O. scan, but concurrently with the PLC program, similar to an HMI update. With the con within the configuration, all the inputs and outputs are accessible. Configuration is as easy as dragging and dropping the factory inputs and outputs to the corresponding point on the host block. Designing for the user is very important, and before we discuss the HMI, I would like to introduce a book. It's a little bit dated, but I think it's very much applicable. The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman explores the psychology of design, and he makes a couple of very important points about the human memory and how we use technology. So with this in mind, I designed the, designed the HMI to be a more flat style of menu system. Shown here is part of a real menu system that I had the displeasure of using at General Motors, which was basically a spider web of interconnections and inconsistencies between menu buttons and functions. Even a diagram of this small portion of the HMI demonstrates that a path that can get you to a screen where there's no direct path back to the main menu. It just becomes very cumbersome and very difficult for the user to learn. Mr. Norman discusses this problem and our tendency to switch to problem solver mode, which means we just start pressing buttons at random. This shows the nine basic screens, not including the seam and system functions. I have a mode screen, an elevator screen, pallet to conveyor control, weight configuration, scale conveyor control, input status, output status, alarm, and alarm history. Now there are two input status screens and two output status screens, but they do not violate the integrity of the flat menu style I created. I can show you this more during the live demonstration. So what is a flat menu concept? Simply stated, all main screens are accessible from each other. There's no searching for screens, there's minimal opera training involved, and additional I.O. screens can be nested without com compromising the design for human concept. With that being said, I've also included a password protected setting screen and a different style, which is setting features not available unless in manual mode. So there's two me methods demonstrated here, uh, PLC controlled and HMI controlled. 
and I was able to embed that all into the flat menu concept. So I can, as you can see here with this animation, the concept here is that all the screens are accessible from each other. And it doesn't matter what screen you're on, you can get to any screen you want without searching. There's minimal operator training involved because all the information is available at a glance. Additional IO screens are nested without com compromising that design for human concept as I stated before. So as you can see, pressing any menu button along the bottom brings you to any available screen. And the menu itself, as well as the headers, is pretty much the same on every screen. So there's no nested menus. An operator can easily operate this or use this with very little training. The cool thing about the S7 1200 PLC is that it has a built-in web server. So with some very simple HTML code, I can create a basic screen with some usefulness. The left screen here shows that a display of the box count, number of completed layers, as well as allowing a counter reset function. The right screen is the mode and system start control screen. Automatic, manual reset, run, stop, and system reset are all available as, as well as a simple status of each of the major functions and a basic alarm or system message. What I tried to do here is keep the code simple. Using a very basic table format to display the data for the count screen allowed this to be the entire HTML code. This also includes the counter display, reset button, and the buttons to switch to the next screen. The manual and auto mode control screen has one extra level of complexity in the form of some basic JavaScript in order to display a header for the system and status indicators above the manual, auto, and system start buttons. Nothing fancy, again, uh, in keeping it simple, I only have one file that accomplishes all the functions required for the entire screen. So you can see here the factory control on my phone wireless, wirelessly communicating with my router and back to the simulation through the PLC. This might be difficult to see on the screen, but my phone display shows the system running in automatic and in normal configuration. Now, if I generate a fault, the web page displayed on my phone will automatically switch over and show me that I have, in this case, an invalid wait fault. Thank you for watching. And now let's switch over to the demonstration.